Becoming a great commission Christian. What is a great commission Christian? Basically, it's someone who is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with unbelievers. It's sharing with people what God and Jesus has done in your life. And then, then it's for those who have committed to say yes to Jesus and follow Jesus, it's then helping them to become the disciples that Jesus is asking them to be. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, then you are called to be an instrument of outreach and ministry for God's mission, right? Like we are doing all of this for God. God has given us such powerful news, such wonderful news, and he does not intend for us to keep it to ourselves. So that's why as a church, we're doing this jumpstart, if you would, for outreach of how to be thinking outside this church, how to be thinking about the unbelievers, how to be thinking about the ones that are disconnected to Christ. And a goal, again, is to set a culture in this church that when you think about church, it's not so much that you think about the Bible study or our gatherings and our activities, it's that you think about reaching other people for Christ. Like that's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about church, reaching other people, reaching other people so they too will know about Christ. And I know that's a really big goal right? That's a really big goal. And I also know this is a goal that is not going to happen overnight. The culture in our minds, that practice is not just going to happen by tomorrow. In fact, it could take us months. It could take us a couple of years to really make that the culture of this church and to have our minds always focus on that. But what I do know and believe wholeheartedly is that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can absolutely make that our culture. We can absolutely make that the first thing that comes to our mind when we think about church. As we learn to be a Great Commission Christian, we're going to be looking at just one more story of Jesus after his death, before he ascended to heaven in this 40-day time frame where he appeared to over 500 people. Uh, We know at least at 10 different occasions he appeared to people. And uh, one of the accounts is, well, before I get there, I want to say that these accounts, first and foremost, show two things. They show that, number one, Jesus did rise from the dead and that he is absolutely alive. But they also show that he is who he says he is, which means he is going to do what he says he's going to do, right? He said he was going to rise from that grave. He was going to be living again, and that's exactly what he did. So just a few weeks ago, now probably about three weeks ago, um, the last time we talked about becoming a Great Commission Christian, we looked at the story where Jesus gave the Great Commission to the disciples and to every generation that follows after them, and this was all happening just before he was ascending to heaven. And we call it the Great Commission because of the important message that it is. It's great because of the important message, and it's commission because it's a command from Jesus. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, if you want to do this for me, he's telling us, I need you to do this for me. This is what I want you to do. If you are going to follow me, which I'm asking you to follow me, then here's what I want you to do. Be a great commissioned Christian. So we're commissioned to go. We're commissioned to share. We're commissioned to be witnesses of what Jesus has done in our lives. And hopefully we do that gladly because we're grateful for what Jesus has done in our lives, right? We're grateful for, number one, that he died on the cross for us. But we're also grateful for what he does in our daily lives and where he meets us every day, all the time. But I also want to suggest that there's another reason why we should be witnesses. Another reason why we should be sharing this good news, In the scripture today that I'm going to share with you, uh, we're backing up a little bit in the chronological order. We're going back to what happened just before the Great Commission um, that Jesus gave to us. And this is a story. It's a love story. It's not a boy meets girl kind of sappy love story. This is a love story that's an even deeper kind of love. So I want to set the scene here for you. It comes from John 21, and I'm just going to sort of set the scene for the first half of of the chapter, and then we'll read the second half half, half of the chapter. Excuse me. Um, So just to set the scene, most disciples at this point have seen Jesus face to face at least twice. Peter has seen him three times. And they're still waiting. They're still in this kind of holding moment, this holding time, where they're just trying to figure out what Jesus is going to do next, what their part in the story is going to be next, what their part in God's kingdom and the future ministry is going to be. And Peter, he's still feeling a bit like a failure. Because remember, Peter had these moments where he, uh, he told Jesus, I would never deny you. But Jesus says, hey, you're going to deny me three times, three times. And when the third time happens, a rooster's going to crow, and that's how you're going to know <laughs> that I'm right about this. And that's exactly what happened, isn't it? Peter denied him not once, not twice, but three times. And as soon as that third time happened, the rooster crowed, and it hit him. He knew Jesus was right. 
this is exactly what happened. Now, when Jesus warned him that this is what was going to happen, Peter defended himself. He said, I would never do that. Never. I will never deny you. I would die for you before I deny you. But that's the exact opposite of what happened. So Peter is feeling quite discouraged. He's still feeling like the failure. He's still beating himself up about this because he knows. He gets it, right? And so he says, you know what? I got to just do something. We're waiting. We're just hanging out. Jesus isn't here. He's showing up every now and then. I don't know what to do with myself. I've got to have something to do. So he goes back to the trade that he knows how to do. He fishes. He says, I'm going fishing. And so six other disciples say, you know what? <laughs> We're just waiting too. We're tired of waiting too. We're going to go with you. So they all go fishing. And uh, what I want to see here, I want to show you rather, is that doing this, they're really falling back. You know, a lot of times we fall back when we don't know what to do, when we're just waiting. We fall back to the things we do know. And that can be good when it's Jesus, <laughs> when we're falling back to his word, when we're falling back to his ways. But that's not often what we do. When we get lost or when we feel like a failure, when we feel like we're just hanging out and we don't know what to do with this, we often go back to the bad habits. We go back to the things that we're really not supposed to do. We're going back to the things that distance us actually from Jesus, the things that he tells us not to do, the direction he doesn't want us to really go. And that's really what these guys are doing. They're going back to what they know for sure, right? And they're going back to what they think they can do well. And they think that maybe this is going to bring them some peace. This is going to bring them a little bit of a feeling, a little bit better than the failure feeling that they're feeling in the moment. So they go out fishing and they go all night long. That's the best time for fishing, apparently. Uh, I remember fishing as a teenager a couple times with friends at nighttime. I don't really remember catching a lot of fish at that time, but whatever. That's what these guys do. They're, they're professionals. I'm not. So they're fishing all night long. They're out there hour after hour after hour, and they catch absolutely nothing. But this is what they know best, right? This is what they know how to do, yet they catch absolutely nothing. So by the time the daylight comes, sun is coming up, they're realizing we're not getting anywhere, they're tired, they're ready to quit, go back home. And along the shore, they notice a man. And this man, they can't quite tell who he is because the Bible says that it's 100 yards away. Well, I don't know about you, but I can barely see 20 yards. So 100 yards, I definitely can't pick out who is who. And this man yells, have you caught any fish? And they respond, no. Now, many of you probably know the end of this story. And if you don't, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Who's the man? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Okay, so we'll give the benefit of the doubt here to the disciples because, again, he's far away. They can't quite see him, but Jesus also looks a little bit different. Let's not forget that. When Jesus came back, when he rose from the grave, he looks a little bit different. Mary Magdalene, for instance, stood right in front of him. Yes, I know she had tears in her eyes, but she stood right in front of him, and she didn't recognize him until he said her name. So they're not necessarily understanding. They can't quite see who it is. But yet there's this curiosity that we read about that they have in who this person might be. So they say, no, we haven't caught any fish. And he says, then throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, as professional fishermen, this is their master craft. I can imagine their minds going, that is not going to do a thing. Literally just to put it like six feet over, that's not going to do a thing. But yet for some reason, they have this curiosity enough that they do it. Why is that? Is it maybe because they've seen this kind of thing before, and this is a little bit familiar? In Luke 5, early in Jesus' ministry, he does a miracle with them. In fact, what's happening in this story is that Jesus is preaching to a crowd of people. The crowd keeps growing, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the crowd gets bigger, Jesus keeps getting pushed back. And as he gets pushed back, all of a sudden he's along the beach, then he's along the edge of the water, and he can't go any further. And Peter's boat is right there. Peter had been fishing out all night long. He just comes in, and Jesus says, hey, can I get in your boat? Can we back up just a little bit so I can preach to this crowd? And Peter's like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Again, tired, has been out all night long. He says, that's fine. But then Jesus says to Peter, when he's done preaching to the crowd, he says, hey, Peter, let's go out and throw in the net and do some fishing. And Peter's like, are you serious? <laughs> I have been out all night long. I'm tired. I'm done. I want to go home. But sure. Why not? And he just does it to appease Jesus. And they go out, and you know what happens? They catch such a load of fish in the net that Peter can't pull it in by himself. So he has to call two of his buddies to come out and help get these fish all into the boat. 
they have seen this before. They've seen this kind of miracle before. This is where Jesus does a Jesus kind of thing, where he's standing along the shore. They don't quite recognize who he is, but they have his curiosity. And Jesus says, go ahead and throw that net on the other side of the boat. And when they throw the net over there, making no sense at all of why to do that, they scoop up so many fish that it stretches their net. In fact, the Bible tells us, which I find is really interesting, it tells us the exact number of fish that they caught. Does anybody know that number? Very good, 153, not small, not medium, but large fish, it says. 153 large fish. That first off tells me those gentlemen counted. <laughs> why would you count? Because this was too amazing not to count, right? That's probably one reason. So 153 fish stretching their mat nets to the limit, and immediately when they get all those fish in the net, it registers with John. And John says, it's Jesus. It's the Lord. That's the Lord along the shore. And Peter, who had stripped down to his skimpies, I'll call it, he's down to like nothing to fish all night long, throws on his long robe, his long tunic, jumps into the water, which you think would be the other way around. Maybe, I don't know. I don't think I could swim with a long robe on, but he does it. And he swims a hundred yards to the shore as fast as he possibly can, excited to see Jesus, leaving all his buddies out there to get in those 153 fish and take them to the shore. And as soon as they all get to the shore, excited, more than excited, and they have every reason to be excited, of course, but they arrive to the shore and they find that breakfast is ready for them. It's waiting for them. Fish and bread, it says. Jesus had prepared breakfast for them. Once again, here Jesus is serving them. Right? You remember how he washed their feet? Now he's serving a meal to them. And I love, I just love how Jesus is purposely showing up in their everyday lives. Right? They feel like failures. They feel like they don't have anything right now. And Jesus shows up right then and there. So in an instant when they feel like failures, Jesus stood on the shoreline, still helping, still empowering, still teaching. Yes, this time from a distance, and maybe some of that is to prepare the disciples because he's about to ascend to heaven, right? He's going to be doing everything from a, a distance, if you would. But he's still teaching them, still empowering them, still helping them. And the first lesson here that he's showing to them, that their work yielded nothing without him, right? Like, you're not going to be able to do what I'm calling you to do without me. So don't go off and do things that I'm not asking you to do because you're not going to get anywhere. And as soon as Jesus comes into the picture, what happens? They catch 153 large fish. And then after breakfast, we see the next lesson. And this is where I want to pick up in the story. Jesus has something to ask Peter. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked a question, the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, which is John, the author of this book, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during, the, during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? As for you, follow me. So there's a couple things happening here. Let me just touch base on a couple before I get too deep into this. So Jesus tells Peter how he's basically going to die, which is how Peter died. Peter died on a cross just like Jesus, except for Peter says, I am not worthy to die in the same way that Jesus died, so turn me upside down. 
So basically what Jesus is saying, you're going to have people dress you, you're going to have people take you to places you don't want to go, and you're going to die in a way that you don't want to die, but this is what you're going to do to glorify the Lord, right? This is what's going to happen eventually. And so that, that was that. And this piece about John, Peter is so curious to say, okay, well, you want me to do this. You're telling me to do all this, but what about this guy? I know you love him a lot too, Lord. I know he's a part of the group, right? We're all close friends. What about him? And Jesus says, I don't want you to focus on him. I want you to focus on your choices right now. I'm asking you for a specific reason, Peter, and I want you to focus on that. So how many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? How many? Three. Three, Three okay. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. This is a painfully familiar number to Peter, isn't it? A painfully... You want to know why it hurt Peter that Jesus asked him three times? This is why. This is a painful number. Jesus told Peter at the Last Supper that he would deny him three times, and that's exactly what he did. And at this point, at this point in the story, I'm going to assume, because I don't know, we don't actually have the conversation written and recorded for us in Scripture, but it's very likely that Jesus has already forgiven Peter for doing that. Right? You remember the, the personal conversation or the personal uh, account of, of Peter seeing Jesus by himself. The two gentlemen from Emmaus had come back, right? They took the walk with Jesus to Emmaus. And by the time they got there and broke bread, they realized who Jesus was. And they came running back late at the night to tell all the other disciples who, or that they just saw Jesus alive, that it's true. Hey, you remember what the women said? Hey, it's actually true. And they, they come back telling all of this. And the other disciples say, yeah, we now believe the women too. Should have believed him to begin with. <laughs> but we now believe the women too, because Peter saw him. So Peter has this one-on-one -on -one account with Jesus. We don't have that recorded, but it's likely that's when Jesus gave Peter the forgiveness that he truly needed. There are two things that are happening here. First, Jesus is leading Peter through an experience that would remove his guilt, that would remove his cloud of guilt and shame. I know that I am my own worst critic. Anybody else your own worst critic? Be honest. Are you? Okay. We can beat up on ourselves very, very easily. But you know what that often does? It often prevents us from also forgiving ourselves pretty easily. So I one time, I, I know I did something, um, it just broke Jesus' heart. In my mind, it was pretty horrific. I'm sure in his mind, it was pretty horrific. And I asked Jesus for forgiveness for this for an entire year. Over and over and over again. I kept saying, would you just forgive me for this? Would you forgive me for this? You know, I recently read something where somebody said, oh, we don't hear God's voice like a voice of somebody talking in our ear. And, and I squash that. That's not true. I've heard it a couple times. And this was one of them. And I heard God say to me, I forgave you the first time you asked. You can stop. A whole year later, and what I realized in that moment, it wasn't that God didn't forgive me. I didn't keep asking because God hadn't forgave me. I kept asking because I hadn't forgiven myself for what I had done. The second thing that's happening here is Jesus is asking Peter to recommit his life to the ministry. In fact, actually, he's asking him to commit to the next part of the ministry, right? Like, this is going to be so much more. You've been walking with me for three years. I've been showing you the way. Now I'm not going to be here. Now you're going to need to do this a little bit more on your own with the Holy Spirit. I'm not totally leaving you. But you're not going to see me face to face and have me giving you direction to direction. You're going to need to do this, Peter. In fact, it's going to be, was what he said here, you're going to give glory to God by dying for me. Right? So he's asking Peter to recommit himself back to the ministry of Christ. So Jesus starts by taking Peter back to the very beginning. He calls him by his birth name. Anybody else pick up on that? He called him by Simon, son of John. He is saying, this is who you were to begin with. Okay. So when Peter, or when uh, Jesus changed his name to Peter, Peter, we know, means rock. Right? So really, Simon, and this isn't technical, but it's like Simon just means pebble. Right? So he goes from pebble to being rock. So then Jesus asks this question, the same question, three times. But if you look carefully, Jesus actually changes up the question just slightly every time he asks it. The Greek language has many, many variations of the word love, whereas in English, we unfortunately are limited to just one. So when it's translated from Greek to English, we actually lose some of the meaning of the words that Jesus is using here. 
Um, the first time that Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He uses the word agape. And we've often talked about that word in this church. And agape means unconditional love. It means a sacrificial love, all right? So you're giving something up to give this love, right? You're doing this um, with a purpose. And he says, Simon, son of John, I think I have it up here. Do you love me more than these? And when he says these, he's saying what's in front of him. And what did they just do? They were fishing, right? There's 153 large fish in front of him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this life that you know? Do you love me more than what you know all so well, what you're comfortable with? Do you love me more than that? In other words, will you sacrifice for me? Will you give up this life that you know for me? Will you do this and go into ministry full time? Totally give up this craft once and for all and go into ministry full time. And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Peter knows that Jesus knows everything, right? He knows that he can see into his heart and he says, you know that I love you. Agape is understood to be the general meaning of the word love. It's a love that is based not on merit. There's nothing you can do to earn this kind of love. It's just a love that is kind. It's a love that is generous. It continues to give even when we don't feel like the other one really deserves it or they're unworthy, right? And it gives anyways. It desires to do good things for the other. It's compassionate. So the second time Jesus asks the question, he uses the word agape again. But this time he directs the question more to Peter alone. He says, Simon, son of John... Do you love me? So in other words, do you choose me? Do you choose me? Will you give me a sacrificial love? Will you offer yourself? When we celebrate Holy Communion, one of the commitments that we make to Jesus is to say, yes, I will be a holy and living sacrifice for you. That's what he's asking Peter here. Will you offer yourself? And Peter again answers, yes, you know that I love you. By the third time that Jesus asked Peter if he loves him, he uses a different word. It's not agape this time. It's filio. Filio speaks of affection, fondness, liking the other. This love is relational. It's brotherly kind of love. It's a friendship love. And I'm intrigued that Jesus cho chose to use this word filio as a way to force Peter to think deeper about what Jesus is asking him. He wanted to know if Peter really loved him, not just because of who he is, not just because Jesus is God, right? He wants to know if Peter really deeply loves him as in a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a brother, a friend, a Lord, a savior. Yes, a personal relationship. He wants to know if Peter really loves him in that way, because really to be reconciled, both of these kinds of love, a filio and affection, or excuse me, a filio, filio and agape, um, unconditional love, sacrificial love, affection, brotherly love, it takes all of that to get true reconciliation. And even though Peter messed up, one of the best things I love about this story is that Jesus doesn't give up on him. Doesn't that give us a lot of hope? <laughs> even though we're going to mess up, we could do the worst thing in the world and deny Jesus too, and he isn't going to give up on us. Jesus knew Peter's heart. He knew Peter truly did love him. But he wanted Peter to realize how deep his love for Jesus is. He wanted Peter to voice that so that he could help Peter walk through getting rid of this guilt and shame that he was still carrying. He wanted to walk him through that, yes, I forgive you. Now you can forgive yourself. And now you can commit to being a disciple of Jesus Christ again. So Peter's three confessions of love for Jesus counteracted his three times of denial. And Jesus was, in a sense, restoring him. He was reconciling him. He was reinstalling him as a disciple. Now, something to note here, which I find very interesting, too, is that when Peter answered the question, yes, Lord, I love, yes, Lord, you know I love you, every time he answered that, do you know which love he used? It wasn't agape. He used filio, meaning that I love you like my brother. I love you in a deep, personal way. I love you like that. And Jesus says, okay, if you filio me, if you love me in such a deep way, then do two things. First, follow me. 
follow me and then feed my sheep. Care for my lambs, meaning care for the people who are also following me and care for those who do not know me yet. And that's exactly what Peter does. When we look at the book of Acts, you can see that Peter is a very changed person. And he's doing exactly this. I think Peter was set so on fire for Jesus. And what Jesus was trying to pull out and say, remember that love you have for me, that deep personal love you have for me. That's what's going to keep you going and do what I'm asking you to do. It's not because you know who I am. It's not even because of what I've done for you. It's because you have a deep personal love for me. So pull that back out, Peter. Let's remember that. And then follow me and feed my lambs. So Peter went from being a fisherman to being an evangelist, from being impulsive to being a rock. And once Peter was restored by Jesus, he was able to embrace, truly embrace the grace of God and become this powerful yet tender leader that Jesus needed him to be. I imagine that this experience of denial and forgiveness is how Peter related with everybody he ever spoke to, everybody he ever taught about Jesus Christ, right? Because everybody gets that. We've sinned against Jesus, and Jesus is ready to forgive you if you let him, if you just take it. And after this conversation with Jesus, Peter's life has just totally changed. He went from thoughtless or not really thinking about what he says, being impulsive, to living in glory for God. You know, like he was filled with the spirit in a way that made him glow with this new power, a power that we're going to talk more about next week, but a, a power that just gave him this urgency to say, I have to do this, an urgency for the mission of Jesus Christ. And honestly, we, we brought this up a couple times in our, our Wednesday night Bible study this past week, that word urgency, I think that's where it was, and even in the prayer meeting that we had last Sunday night, and that word just keeps sticking with me. There is an urgency, and we should all have an urgency inside of us that we need to be a part of this mission. We need to be a Great Commission Christian. We need to be a Great Commission church, putting this ministry, outreach ministry, at the front of everything we do because there's such a great urgency. It breaks my heart to think about this, but there are people that I know, and there are people that you know, that if they die right here, right now, they're not going to heaven. There's an urgency. And we have the news. We have the key. We have the message that they need to hear. Tell your coworkers. Tell your friends. Tell your family member. I, I'm getting together with my family today, and I don't know how it's going to come up. I don't know how I'm going to say it, but I'm absolutely going to say, please come to church. There's an urgency. I, I want to walk with you in heaven. <laughs> Right? Like, that's what keeps coming to my mind. I want to walk with you in heaven. How many here know somebody that you're afraid they might not be going to heaven, but you would love to walk with them in heaven? That means there's an urgency. This relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, it should be like falling in love with Jesus every day. And it should just burn in us that we love him so much that we want to love the people he loves too. And he really wants to see all of his creation with him for eternity. And yeah, it's a big job, but each one matters, right? Every time I hear somebody starting to follow Christ, every, every time I hear somebody is coming to church now, they're going to church, they're getting, they're getting a Bible, they want a specific Bible to be able to read so that they can relate with the Jesus they know. That's love. That's a deep love. And this love that we have for Jesus should be enough to push us to see the urgency and to say, okay, we'll share it. We have a calling in our lives. We have a purpose. We have a duty. Sharing the word of Jesus should be our response for the gratefulness that we have for what Jesus has done for us. But even more so, it should be the response because we love Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. And I pray today, God, that we hear these three times of Jesus asking, do you love me more than these? Do you love me? 
do you filio me? I pray, God, that every time we hear those questions and think about them, we put ourselves in those shoes. Do we really love Jesus? Do we have a deep love for him? If we don't, Father, I pray for that to grow. I pray for our hearts to be open, to know you for who you are, to know you for what you've done for us, and to know you for the great good that you can do in this world through us. God, I pray that most importantly, that we serve you, that we go ahead with this great commission, becoming great commission Christians and a great commission church because of the love we have for you. I would imagine, Lord, that everybody here knows who you are. That's why we're here to worship you. That's why we're here to learn from you and to connect with you. So, Father, do that. Today, connect our hearts with your heart. Let our hearts see the way your heart sees, feel the way your heart feels. Let us sense the urgency that there are people every day dying who don't know you, who aren't going to heaven. Father, may that just thought alone set us on fire and give us courage, no matter how afraid we are, to ask and to invite, to share, to witness. And Father, truly, may we begin to make disciples for you. Give us your Holy Spirit, Father, to share and to do all of this, to follow you, just like Peter did. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.